It's an early summer evening in an airfield in Georgia. The tension as palpable as the humidity. A new plane is scheduled to make its first flight tomorrow, and things have to go well. The F-22 Raptor is a fighter for the next century. This conglomeration of titanium, aluminium, and thermoplastics incorporates bold and forward-thinking designs. It possesses speed, stealth, and flight control systems designed to give its pilot overwhelming superiority against the current and future enemy weapon systems. It's the fighter that today's children may fly tomorrow. With it, they will be masters of future air war, capable of overwhelming an enemy into submission. More than 10 years of work and complicated web of contractors and subcontractors in 46 states have gone into producing this next generation fighter. But already the Raptor has a troubled past. First, the Air Force made demands for fighter capabilities, but no one was sure they could be met. The funding cuts caused restructuring and repeated delays in development. A prototype crash. A subsequent version had so many problems, its first test flight was delayed for months. The plane is faced and still faces criticism from advocates of other planes and from Congress, which has been fretting over the F-22's cost. The last thing the plane's supporters need now is a bungled test flight that adds to the criticism and further clouds the future. The people who know this plane immediately believe this is what America needed for the future. They are as ardent in the support for the F-22 as the critics are opposing in it. According to phrase, once upon a time, there are going to be two kinds of airplanes. There's F-22s and there's targets. But there are tests to be passed. And tomorrow will be one of them. Inside Building B-1 at Lockheed Martin Aeronautical Systems in Marietta, Georgia, a deceptive peacefulness hangs over the assembly line. Work here is also done after months of preparation. An aircraft assembled here will take flight for its first time. A major milestone for even the simplest airframe. Sitting on a ramp some two miles away, the F-22 is not scheduled to take off for at least six hours, but already crew members are hard at work. They double-check and triple-check every last inch of the aircraft. Absolutely no one wants their assembly, their system, their one small piece in this $187 million puzzle to go awry. In fact, components on the ship 4002, as the aircraft is known here, have been meticulously tested and retested ever since the plane rolled out of the assembly hangar in February, some four months ago now. The day has come for this aircraft's maiden flight. The F-22 cannot stumble. The Raptor must accomplish what is called a flight with no squawks. That is a test flight that goes off without a hitch. At 5 a.m., the pace of preparations starts to pick up. No detail, however small, can be overlooked. Not even the removal of a potentially damaging pebble. A cleaning truck patrols the ramp area, vacuuming up such debris. Lockheed Martin's security officer, Patty Howarth, holds a quick briefing to remind her staff of their priorities. Everybody forgot everything they learned on how to drive on the flight line, and every single person who had a flight line pass was after driving on Friday. Everyone. Howarth will spend the rest of the morning making sure her security team keeps the taxiway clear. Then, she will join on the rescue team standing by to assist with security in the case something goes wrong. Patty also worked on the security detail when Ship One flew for the first time. It was probably one of the greatest days of my life. I've never really been involved in aircraft, and I thought, oh, it'll just be another day. But it was probably 110 the first day it lifted off, and I had goosebumps going up my spine. 
As the sun rises, responsibilities are handed off from the night crew to the crew that will launch the plane. Crew Chief Terry Byer oversees it all, supervising every crew member working on the F-22 today. He's been up since 2 a.m. A very vested personal interest. Uh, very little sleep last night. Uh, tossed and turned. It's been eight years to get this far, so it's, uh, we're looking forward to a fun day. Among Byer's responsibilities this morning is ensuring all instrumentation and systems are functioning so the team can get data on the plane's performance. That data will flow back to a control room here at Marietta. It's very important in the program that we've demonstrated not only to uh, the company people, but to uh, the General America and Congress that this airplane can be built here in Marietta and we have competent people. We've, we've decreased our build time here by over three months. And, and the number of write-ups that we have left open to do is down to a handful of write-ups versus the first airplane. We had significant things that we had to fix when we come back as far as things that we couldn't complete to go fly. Buyer believes that won't be the case this time, but he won't know for sure until his flight is over. The man with the best vantage point to compare Ship 1 and Ship 2 is test pilot Paul Metz. Metz, who flew Raptor 1 on its first flight, is a former U.S. Air Force fighter pilot with more than 7,000 hours flight time and more than 33 years of experience. He's been the chief test pilot for the F-22 program since 1992. Uh, how dangerous is my job? They don't sell insurance too readily to us uh, <laughs> for this job. But uh, quite frankly, uh, the job has become uh, much uh, safer and much more controlled. Uh, if you look back to the early days of flight test, uh, there were a great number of losses of life in aircraft. Uh, we're actually able to use simulators today to predict very, very well uh, what we're going to see. After several flights in the first F-22, Metz thinks the aircraft will endure itself to future pilots in a number of ways. From the simple things like uh, amazingly soft landings and, and the ability to feel really good about yourself when you come back from a flight uh, in terms of your ability to fly it, to uh, extreme maneuverability, to uh, cockpit displays and information that are beyond the realm of the current fighter pilot to envision uh, and the ability to sneak around in space without people seeing you. Uh, all of these things together make for a tremendous package and uh, the fighter pilots of the future are going to point to the F-22 as their favorite, I'm, I'm sure of that. On the ramp, the ground crew continues working. Byers is already pacing. Dan Stevens is the senior avionics technician for the F-22 program. He's responsible for the computers and other electronics on the aircraft to make sure they are functioning and ready when the pilot gets into the cockpit. Backing him up are a team of experts for every computer on the plane. We actually have IPT engineers that are ready for their systems as they develop problems and answer any questions. If I have a question, that I know who to go to. We have experts on every component on the aircraft. That's the F-22's pioneering electronics are perhaps the crew's biggest source of worry. They've undergone extensive testing, and Stephen believes most of the problems have been ironed out. But until this plane executes a flawless flight, Stevens won't be able to relax. All of us are putting uh, quite a bit of effort into it to see that it makes its goals, and especially this flight this morning. We're very proud of this aircraft, and we know it's going to take us through this millennium and beyond. The pride comes from long hours. Flight test engineer Hal Wyeth has been on the ramp since 3.30 a.m. Well, it broke a little sweat, but we're doing real good. His team has actually been running final checks since last night. But for Wyeth and his crew, the payoff will come the same way it did with Ship One, with a successful flight. Wyeth recalls how he felt watching the flight of the first F-22. When he actually rotated and broke ground, it was a great feeling after all the effort that's been put in by so many people. Uh, you get a little lump in your heart, you know, that kind of thing. Today, however, the emotions may run deepest for this man. Vincent Devino 
is the team leader for airworthiness and delivery crew. He's been sheepherding the F-22 from the beginning, sweating the details for 10 years. I couldn't begin to count them. Uh, and, you know, you're looking at you're looking at everything here from the airplane uh, readiness, fueling, uh, security of the ramp, uh, making sure you have the right number of people and the right and the right skills uh, aboard. There's there's quite a few things that uh, that go into uh, you know, saying the airplane is ready for flight. But this will be the last time Davino has to officially worry about a flight. After four decades in the business, he's retiring. Into failed or delayed test flights is not how he wants to end his career. A lot of emotion that goes along with it. Like? Like, uh, you know, there's a lot of time and uh, 42 years of uh, experience in his business about to uh, come to a close here. As it sits on the map this morning, the Raptor is just a couple of miles from where it was assembled, but Ship 2 is years removed from its birth, and in terms of technology, light years beyond its ancestors. The impetus for the F-22 began in 1981, when the Air Force announced that it needed a new air superiority fighter. Fighters such as the French Rafel, the Eurofighter Typhoon, and new generations of Russian Sukhoi and MiG have steadily reached parity with, and in some cases surpassed, the F-15. Additionally, Russian-made SA-10 and SA-12 air defense missiles could shoot down an F-15. They were for sale to any country with enough money to buy them. So the Air Force began looking for a new fighter that, once again, would allow the U.S. to leapfrog the lethal competition. The F-22 is going to help us own the skies, and owning the skies is what will allow us uh, to dominate future battlefields in a way that will enable every other part of our military force, whether it be forces on the ground, at sea, or in the air, Owning the sky makes everything else work. The new fighter would need the classic ingredients of air superiority. Speed and agility. Comprehensive situational awareness. The ability to shoot before being seen. And the ability to elude ground threats. But the Air Force decided it wanted to look far into the future, to a fighter that would be superior starting in 2004, and dominate at least 25 years beyond that. That meant a huge leap into the next millennium for the aircraft designers. They would have to predict future enemy capabilities and concoct a fighter that could respond with overwhelming superiority. But asking manufacturers to look that far ahead was like asking designers at the P-51 to foresee the impact of jet propulsion and predict the development of the F-4 Phantom 25 years later. Design teams look for the 1980s equivalent of the development of jet propulsion. They found it in the computer. By 1986, a profound shift away from massive mainframe computers had begun with the miniaturization of electronics that opened new possibilities for design of the fighter for the next millennium. Under development at the time was stealth technology. Stealth modifies a plane's physical characteristics, primarily its external surfaces and heat signatures to reduce its radar profile. The Air Force had already begun huge leaps in stealth with its F-117 fighter and B-2 bomber. Strategists have called for such an aircraft as the need and development for small expeditional forces to respond to regional conflicts around the globe. The stealth aircraft offered a perfect fit for such operations in that it could carry out a mission quickly, with precision, without detection, and without the need for support aircraft. And stealth became a requirement for the new fighter. The Air Force also demanded that it fly at supersonic speeds without afterburner. Designers mindful of the requirement for domination in the next century also proposed a fighter that used easily upgradable computers. 
The computers would provide the pilots seamless situational information. To get on top of it, and it's down. coming back down here. Computers would also coordinate with the other stealth technology to deny the enemy information about the plane's whereabouts. The idea was to have a plane that would give its pilot first look, first shot, first kill capabilities, then zoom away undetected until the initial targets exploded. A third consideration arose from Congress. Federal budget constraints likely would limit the number of planes built, so the new fighters would have to be more with fewer numbers. They would have to be more destructive and deadly, and allow the U.S. to win quickly and decisively, with minimal casualties to Americans. This airplane is the future of our country. Uh, it will allow us to own the skies over any future battlefield, and owning the skies over those battlefields is going to keep Americans alive. And that's what the mothers and fathers of America are going to want. But this futuristic vision required a lot of work. The avionics goal alone seemed huge. In 1986, close to impossible. Computers that could handle all the plane's requirements didn't exist. Design teams fretted over whether they could pull off this new airplane. Nevertheless, they forged ahead. In 1986, the Air Force selected two teams of defense contractors, Lockheed, Boeing, General Dynamics, and Northrop McDonnell Douglas, to build prototype airplanes known as the YF-22 and the YF-23. Engine makers Pratt & Whitney and General Electric were selected to build prototype engines and all the Air Force would have four versions of this new plane to consider. The prototypes materialized and began test flights in 1990. Northrop McDonnell Douglas's YF-23 was a graceful aircraft with forward fuselage resembling a gooseneck stretched out in flight. Its wings created a clip diamond pattern with all edges swept forward or back by 40 degrees. When viewed from above, its broadly angled twin tails propelled the wing's leading edges. The YF-22 supported a slightly more conventional look, particularly in its shapely jutting twin tails and the more triangular shape of its wings. Designers of both planes incorporated several key developments in stealth, high-speed cruising, and avionics. To increase the fighter's stealth, designers reshaped internal and external parts of the aircraft. They changed how they treated its external surfaces through coating and irregular shapes. Designers also manipulated the plane's heat emissions to mask the fighters from infrared or heat-seeking detectors. The engine makers helped by reducing the need for afterburner to go supersonic. Also modified were the fighter's noises and colors to make it harder to detect by sonar and by the human eye. Ultimately, the fighter's radar cross-section, the element most crucial to foiling the enemy, was reduced until it resembled radar signature of birds and bees. Speed was another way the designers boosted the fighter's air superiority. Conventional fighters get their supersonic speeds through afterburner. But this consumes excessive amounts of fuel and can be used only for a short amount of time. The F-22 Pratt & Whitney engines can develop 35,000 pounds of thrust and push the Raptor to well above Mach 1 without using afterburner. That means the fighter can fly at supersonic speeds for longer periods of time giving it a greater range of operation and enemies less time to react. Designers call this capability Super Cruise. It significantly exceeds the capabilities of engines powering the Air Force current F-15 and F-16 fighters. Finally, the designers incorporated the latest developments into computers to create avionics that give the pilots superior situational awareness. Everything a fighter pilot needs to know, from the location of his wingman and his target, to enemy aircraft and radar sectors. 
is combined into a series of easily understood displays. An enemy aircraft is a red triangle. An unidentified aircraft is a yellow square. Our green square is a friendly aircraft. Wingmen are in blue. All the pilot has to do is to glance down to his situational display and instantly grasp the battlefield around them. In fact, we bring in people who have no flight experience whatsoever, put them in the concept demonstrator, let them use uh, displays that are very close, very similar to what's actually in the airplane. And uh, to a person, they can operate the systems, lock onto targets, and destroy enemy aircraft. Finally, the Air Force demanded that this new fighter demonstrate superior agility. On the YF-23, agility was attained through traditional means, aerodynamics and flight control surfaces. But the YAF-22 added thrust vectoring, using nozzles on the back of the engine to direct thrust up or down. With thrust vectoring, the YF-22 achieved a record high angle of attack, 60 degrees, an angle that would stall most other aircraft. I now announce... In April 1991, U.S. Air Force Secretary Dr. Donald Rice announced that the YF-22 with its Pratt & Whitney F-119 engines would be the design for its future advanced tactical fighter, citing better capabilities and lower costs. The Air Force awarded the winning team a $9.5 billion contract. While design work began on the newly dubbed F-22, the Air Force continued test flights on the YF version. On April 22, 1992, while returning to Edwards Air Force Base in California, the YF-22 began oscillating severely, 40 feet above the runway. Pilot was unable to regain control. The YF-22 crashed and burned. My name is Harold Carlson Farley, Jr., and I was raised under the name of Carlson. When my wife gets serious, she calls me Carlson, but everybody else calls me Hal. And I got that from the military as being Harold to Hal. Skunk Works. Back in uh, 1943, I believe it was, the United States Air Force realized that the Germans were fielding a new jet airplane called the ME-262, a twin-engine jet that was capable of reaching our uh, long-range bombers, the B-17s. So um, they felt that they needed a, a jet airplane. We needed a jet airplane for the Air Force. And so they contacted Lockheed for the job. I'm not sure exactly if what their motivation was to come to Lockheed, but Kelly Johnson was a pretty well-known airplane designer and had been instrumental in the P-38, which was a, a first frontline fighter in the, in the war. Anyway, they came and they said, we need an airplane in five months, uh, a jet airplane in five months. And uh, Kelly Johnson, uh, who was uh, a well-thought-of young engineer who had a very strong personality and a great amount of leadership capability and, and very strong, very strong man. He, um, he said, I'll take on the job. It has to be done by my rules. He had 14 basic sets of rules. I can't name all 14 of them, but a, two or three of them are, are important. One, he gets to select the very best people he has in the whole company. Number two, uh, he reports directly to the company president. Three, nobody else interferes with the project at all. It's his project, and he's the boss, 
and the rest of the people in the Skunk Works are workers. So anyway, that was the rules that he set up for taking on that project. And <clears throat> it took the Air Force a month to deliver the proposal, but in the meantime, he'd already started working on the airplane, knowing full well he was going to be doing it. And they managed to deliver the airplane in uh, 143 days. That comes out a bit shorter than five months, four months and some days, which was pretty phenomenal when you think about it. And it was a pretty advanced airplane. Uh, it was the XP-80 and uh, made its first flight in 1943 and the pilot at controls was a fellow by the name of Milo Burcham, who was later killed in an accident. Mm -hmm. That was how the Skunk Works got its start uh, and its reputation of being able to do a job quickly, on time, and under cost. Well, the name uh, Skunk Works uh, was from the Little Abner comic strip where, I uh, can't remember the character, but he was up in the woods and he would uh, brew up this Kickaboo Joy Juice, some white lightning, I guess, and it smelled bad. And uh, there were some odors that were in the hangar area of Burbank there. And so one day, one of the engineers answered the phone and, and said the skunk works, which was spelled S-K-O-N-K. And uh, everybody started calling it Skunk Works, but the uh, creator of Lil Abner said, no, you can't use that, and, he, and went to court over it. I guess we probably conceded. I don't remember if there's any details of that, but uh, we uh, changed from Skunk Works to Skunk Works, and that's stuck, and we've always had the emblem of a skunk on the tail of the airplanes. The year I joined the Skunk Works was 1978. And the, I joined by uh, because I had been working with a fellow, um, Dr. Ken Stewart. Um, he had a PhD in plasma physics. And he and I had been working on a new head-up display for the F-14. I was working for Grumman at that time. And uh, me notes to me, was also assigned to the head-up display for the new stealth fighter that was being developed at the Skunk Works. I read in the newspaper in the Los Angeles Times a very short paragraph that said a pilot had been injured in the desert. His name was Bill Park, William Park, and there was no details in that little thing, that little clip. And I always remember reading that and realizing or thinking that's very unusual. There was, there's something going on up in the desert that that they're not telling anything about, but they had to say something about the accident. It was my future boss who was in that accident, and he uh, needed a pilot because he had injured himself pretty bad. He had asked some people around, and Ken Stewart recommended me. Uh, he called me one day. He was very abrupt on the telephone. He said, my name's Bill Park. He said, All right, would you be interested in a job at Lockheed? And I said, why? Well, You'd have to tell me something about it. Well, he said it's at the Skunk Works. You know, the Skunk Works is a magic word among pilots, and uh, I was immediately interested when he said that. I said, uh, yeah, I, I, w I would be interested if you could tell me something about it. He said, well, I'll call you back. And, uh, and that was the end of that conversation. And for about three weeks, I figured it went away and wasn't coming back. But he did call me back, and he said, uh, have you thought about it? I said, yeah. Uh, I said I would be interested, and he, he said, all right, he said, I'd like for you to come down for an interview. He said, but I don't want you to come to the company, I want you to come to my house. And so I said, okay, he gave me the address, and it was down in Westwood. And it, the house was on the golf course in, uh, in Westwood, down in the high, high rent district of L.A., and it was a gorgeous home, and I mean, it was, it was a beautiful home and there was nobody there his wife wasn't there she was somewhere else and he greeted me and I came in and, and we had our chat and when I left um, I said man those guys must pay a lot of money turns out that Bill and his wife were really good at real estate but that was uh, how I got uh, introduced to, to uh, the Skunk Works It took about three months to get a clearance. I had a secret clearance from Grumman, but this was secret special access required, which is a couple of levels above secret uh, 
to, to be able to access the program. So I was placed in the uh, penalty box, they called it, until the clearance came through. And then when it came through, they then would could introduce me to what it was we were going to fly. And, and the, I remember uh, Alan Brown was one of the senior engineers, and he took me into a room, and the drawings were up on the, on the wall, regular blue, blueprint drawings. And he said, what do you think of that? And if you, as you know, it's a very unusual looking airplane and it's very highly swept angles. And uh, my first thought was the darn thing must be a re-entry vehicle. It had to be something like that. And uh, then he explained it to me what it was for, that it was to evade radar. And I really didn't pick up on how important that was at the time. I, I thought that was okay. Good. It's to evade radar. How well does it fly? Is it a real fighter? Can we shoot things down with it? You know, what a pilot wants to do is uh, be able to maneuver his airplane well. And and it turns out the airplane is pretty, you know, uh, low performance relatively speaking to the current day fighters. And so um, that's uh, how I was introduced to the airplane. And then I was assigned to the weapon system to work on the displays with my old friend Ken from Grumman, who was working down there at Lockheed and at Grumman at the same time. Well, the first prototype was on the floor. Uh, what was available was the wooden mock-up. They had a complete wooden mock-up, full-scale wooden mock-up they were using to to do the wire runs in. This is really crude you know, manufacturing process quite a few years ago, but they were using this wooden mock-up to, to place displays in the cockpit, to, to locate uh, boxes and, uh, you know, to see if they would fit. And, and We also had offices right alongside that, and we had people that were working on the displays, and, and, and I was assigned to the, to the cockpit and, uh, displays, and we had two other pilots that were uh, working on other aspects of the airplane as well with the engineers. I think it was for two reasons. One, I had been a, a test pilot in industry for a number of years. The other fellows had come directly from the military. It isn't that you can fly any better, it's just that how do you deal with engineering and, and, and the company? Uh, and I was, I think, better prepared to do that than the uh, Air Force guys that were, and, and another Navy guy that came in. I think that was one of the reasons, and uh, the other reason is I worked like the devil. I worked hard because I wanted to be the project pilot on it, and uh, I was selected. That uh, that's what I think was the reason. In order to be able to be the project pilot and the first flight pilot, on, the competition for that is is intense. You want to be the guy that gets the job, and. Uh, and you work hard. That's that's that. Uh, you work with engineering. You work with uh, and you and you're flying. We are flying at the time. We were flying airplanes like T-38s, and uh, so you're being evaluated by the boss and and also the customer. It is something that uh, uh, I don't know how to describe it any other way. It's, it's an intense process. The the. Um, uh, secrecy, the classification of the program was at the same level as the uh, Manhattan Project. That was how how secret it was, and it was very successful. If you recall, we spent many years working and actually having the airplane in operational readiness, and not many people knew anything about it. And uh, so it was uh, highly classified, remotely developed, uh, a lot of time away from family, uh, we spent usually six-day weeks, uh, and we would leave home and come back after Friday or Saturday night and then turn around and go back out Monday morning for, well, I guess probably the first year and a half was that we were separated that much. My wife knew I was flying. I mean, that was my job, but that was all I could tell her. I couldn't tell her what I was flying, where we were. We had a special arrangement, uh, secure telephones, so we could call home through the office 
uh, fairly regularly uh, and and not have to worry uh, you know just to check in and see how everything's going as as, as the hot water heater broken down or whatever but uh, yeah it was it was pretty strenuous on the family life people that I associated with knew that know know about the skunk works. They know you're going to say, "I can't tell you." There, there's nothing I can I can tell you about it. I can tell you, I can say this: the Air Force were flying A7s as a cover airplane. They had a, a squadron of them at Nellis Air Force Base, which were supposedly working on some advanced system, and they were they were kind of secret. But that's where the Air Force was. Uh, they used the A7 as their cover story. Uh, our cover story was just simply we just didn't talk about it. The security that was established within the Skunk Works, the uh, security or the uh, classification uh, culture of the Skunk Works, was developed by Kelly Johnson again. And and back to the um, a little bit about that initial airplane that he built, the XB-80 that started the Skunk Works, one of the requirements was it had to be t- top secret. And one of the reasons for that is it keeps other people out. That was one of the tools to keep other people from becoming involved with the program, p- from becoming a bureaucracy. So the Skunk Works security is was established um, out of common sense, for example, if you put a guard out in front of a, a place, somebody's going to know something's inside. They didn't put any guards out. If you put um, secret or confidential on a, on a drawing uh, of an airplane, uh, you're going to know it's a secret. Something's going on if somebody gets a hold of it. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't uh, stamp any of the things classified at all. They didn't have any guards outside. They made it as... as uh, normal as possible so as to not attract attention. Um, They went so far way back uh, um, when the satellites were first coming out and uh, uh, they took all the names off of the uh, parking places because they could find out who was working there. The, The enemy could find out who was working there, the enemy being the Cold War and Russia. The Skunk Works operated out of Burbank and has operated out of Burbank all the way back to the P-38, to the U-2, to the SR-71, to F-117. All of them have been built there and um, and down in beautiful downtown Burbank inside a big old World War II hangar. The airplanes were uh, assembled there. Then they were, the wings were taken off of them and in the case of the F-117, they flew a C-5 which is the Air Force's huge cargo airplane. They'd, they'd fly it in in the middle of the night, and they would take the phone calls for the noise abatement because there's always somebody in the neighborhood who didn't like the noise, but it only happened every now and then, so we kind of disregarded it. But anyway, they would uh, make a, a box frame out of wood, two-by-fours, and drape a tarp over it so it would not show any part of the shape of the airplane whatsoever. And they put it on wheels, and they would wheel it out put it in the C-5, and then they would fly it off to where we would test the airplane. And uh, it was reassembled and then tested at, at a remote location. And that was done, uh, in fact, back in the SR-71 days, uh, they didn't have a C-5A to transport that around, so they developed a false front, if you will, for a truck line. Lockheed had a trucking company that was named some weird name, and it was on the back of those trucks that they hauled the, the SR-71 fuselage and wings to the, to the test location. The first flight was a success, I'll say that, because we took off and we landed. But uh, there were some uh, problems that we encountered and some, some things we discovered that needed to be fixed. Um, But let me go back just a little bit. The airplane is unstable in pitch and yaw. It can't be flown without the assistance of computers. At the lower speeds, it's about neutrally stable, which is almost flyable. One of the bits of information that goes to the computers to help fly that airplane is the air data that goes in the probes on the front of the airplane. And the engineers were afraid that the vibration of those probes on takeoff and in turbulent air might send vibrations to the flight controls and cause them to oscillate and so therefore they did not want to use the air data on the initial takeoff. 
So what we did was we put a bunch of lead in the front of the airplane and made it positively stable, thinking that I could manage the airplane. Uh, it was still not real stable, but it was stable enough that we felt that I could fly the airplane satisfactorily up to 10,000 feet and then turn on the air data information to the computers so that if it did cause a problem, there would be plenty of room between me and the ground to get those things turned off again and bring the airplane back. That was the plan, and that's what we did. We took off, ballasted with lead in the nose so that it was uh, slightly stable on takeoff, which was fine. The rotation and everything was good in pitch. It was that the fact that the airplane started to yaw, and it went out, I, I believe it was six degrees to the left, and then I tried the rudder to st to stop it and it didn't respond right away and then it slowly came back the other way and went out to around 12 or 13 degrees the other way and that's very uncomfortable in an airplane to feel like you're skidding sideways. And uh, so I realized that th this, th this thing wasn't acting the way we expected to act based on the wind tunnel and simulation that we'd done. Actually, I had uh, three switches for pitch, roll, and yaw over on the left-hand console, and the yaw switch I had had extended because that was the most critical one. And I turned on the air data so that it would come to the, through the probes and go to the flight control computer to help me fly the airplane. And it did. It worked fine. There, was no, there were no vibrations or anything like that. But they got turned on a lot quicker than we planned to do because we were going to go to 10,000 feet to turn them on. Based on that information, we realized that the fins on the airplane, the tail fins on the airplane, were uh, considerably too small. The wind tunnel data, I don't know how it was, a mistake was made. Somehow, uh, I believe I heard that it, they didn't take into full account the sting that the, uh, the pole that you put an airplane in a wind tunnel on contributes to stability. And I'm not sure that's the case. At any rate, they came up with a figure that they, they said we were going to be more stable than we really were. So the fins were too small, and that was the big discovery on the, on the first flight. And we flew the airplane six more times uh, in a very limited flight envelope while they were building a new set of fins 50% bigger that were put on the airplane. And from that point on, we had the proper amount of stability. Uh, those were, that was the big thing learned on the airplane. The, the minor problems that we occurred I, are not minor, really. We had overheat in the tailpipes because the tailpipes were rectangular and in the corners heat builds up. And uh, they, reached, they, they were reaching limited temperatures. And we also had the canopy unlock light that came on and that was uh, of concern because if the canopy had come off, uh, you get a face full of, of wind, and uh, it, it was marginal about whether you could land the airplane or not. Uh, and the other thing was that we heard a big thump, and that was the blow-in doors, which were spring-loaded and activated so that it gave enough air for the airplane on the ground, enough air to the engines to run properly, and then as you accelerated, more air came in the inlets, and then the, the doors would spring-load shut making the airplane stealthy because you can't have openings in the airplane and be stealthy. And when they slammed shut, there was two very pronounced thumps that I hadn't anticipated, scared the heck out of me. And But there was no indication in the control station nor on my instruments, so we continued on with the flight. The flight was only 15 minutes, limited by the uh, temperature in the tailpipe. And that was that was basically the first flight, yeah. No, I've never had a UFO sighting. <laughs> okay, that's good. How we worked together at the Skunk Works and with our customer was absolutely critical to the success of that, of that airplane. Uh, the airplane was a huge success. The program was a huge success. In the world of flight test, in the last 30, 40, 50 years, there's always been a aura of competition between the company pilots and the customer pilots, the Air Force pilot or the Navy pilot that's going to be getting the airplane. Ever since I started the testing business, I was a Navy test pilot for a long time, and then I became a civilian test pilot for Grumman flying F-14s uh, and A-6s, and uh, it was always a us-and-them battle, you know. Uh, 
we felt like we could do it better as company pilots than they could. It was it, it was just kind of I, I know testosterone, ego, whatever you want to call it. It was always a, a, a scrap, and and it, I learned from this experience that cooperation works a whole lot better than ad adversarial relationships. Kelly Johnson's, one of his basic rules was, we need to be allowed to test our product, otherwise we will never be able to you know, advance our products in the future. So he felt like he needed a corporate knowledge in the, in the form of pilot experience in the airplanes uh, uh, that he built. And the Air Force has always felt that they wanted to do all the flying. Um, it's always been a compromise. If you have a combined test force, typically the company does fly the first flight of the airplane and does flutter and does structural and does all that stuff, but the operational aspects are done by the customer, which I think is a good way to do it. But there's always a little bit of a conflict. But we had a very unique individual in the Air Force, a guy by the name of Skip Anderson, who was running the Air Force side of the test force. He had a very unique way of calming us company pilots down. He, he, he provided great leadership, and he worked well with Ben Rich, the head of the uh, Skunk Works, and they got along great, and we saw that, and we all followed suit. And I give Skip a lot of credit for that. Uh, we got along very well. John Beasley was one of the Air Force guys, and uh, he was just one of the team. We were all teammates. One of the criteria for working at our remote location is you had to get along. If anybody didn't get along, you were out of there. So teamwork and cooperation were fundamental to the success of the, of the program. What does it take to make a good test pilot? I think one of the things is you the basic flying skills need to be above average. I think that responsibility to the company and to the product are fundamental to being a good test pilot. I think involvement with the design and development of the airplane is critical to being a good test pilot. I think an engineering degree or uh, advanced degree is, in this, this day and age, the kids that go off to the test pilot schools, they, they arrive there with master's degrees, and a lot of them go away with PhDs, you know. It, they're, they're way above me. I only had a bachelor's degree. But uh, it's hard for me to say I'm, I'm telling you about what I think I am, you know. Am I an above-average pilot? Yeah, I am. I, I can say that honestly. Am I one of those great stick and rudder guys like Bob Hoover, who was a phenomenal pilot, is a phenomenal pilot? I'm not one of those. But do I get involved with the project? I do. I get very involved with the project, or did when I was working. Well, first of all, if I were talking to my grandson, who they're all growing up, my great-grandsons, I would say first thing is honesty. Be totally honest. If you can't be honest, then you're going to tell somebody something that you did that you didn't do. And I learned that really early in test piloting game. Several people had made a mistake. It was a simple mistake. They left a the switch in the wrong place. And if you took off an afterburner, you were dumping fuel, and it would light up, and you'd leave this big, long torch behind the airplane. And I did that. And I came back and I convinced myself that that switch was in the right place and that I didn't switch it, but I did. And so I, I was embarrassed by that. I got caught with my hand in a cookie jar, and that was my real lesson in, in honesty. I, you have to be honest as a test pilot. You can't, you know, if you made a mistake, man, you got to tell them because otherwise they might blame it on the airplane, or they might, you know, the manufacturing process may be changed, or the engineering process. I learned, as I mentioned in the last uh, bit of discussion, that to work with people, you have to respect them, you have to respect their ideas, and you have to present yourself as their co-equal. Honesty, integrity, care for other people, 
in the world of test piloting, once a guy gets to be the chief test pilot, it is normal for the chief test pilot to, to go out and fly all the good stuff. And that was the way it was at Grumman. Uh, there was a man by the name of Corky Meyer for years was the chief test pilot. And anytime a goodie came up, a first flight or a bonus flight, you know, we got extra pay if it was hazardous. The lead guy, the chief pilot, would end up going out and doing it. And there was a fellow there that worked at, at uh, Grumman, and I won't mention his name, became the chief pilot, and he did everything. And the rest of us were doing the dog work. And I said, you know, if I ever get to be chief pilot, I'm going to share the load a little bit. And uh, and those guys, I got to be the first flight pilot. There's two other guys that got, were very lucky that I got to be the first flight pilot in the F-117. Because I said, if I got to be chief pilot, as I said, I, w I, would, just, I would share. And uh, so I had two guys working for me that were, we were very close, Dave Ferguson and Tom Morgenfeld. Dave was an Air Force guy, Tom was uh, a Navy guy. When it came time for the F-22 to come along, I had plans. I was dreaming about sailing around the world, and I thought, and I was getting to be, you know, closer to 55. And so I, I said, I'm going to do what I said I was going to do, and I gave Dave Ferguson the project pilot job. I was the chief pilot and director of flight ops, but he was the project pilot and would be flying the first flight on the F-22. The day he went out and flew that first flight, I was out there, watching it and I was saying man I wish I had made had made that promise but <laughs> I was very envious of the day he got to fly I would have been able to fly the airplane if I had just exercised my rights as the chief pilot and then the, the next airplane the F-35 that came along Tom Morgenfeld got to fly the first flight so uh, each one of us got a first flight and I'm kind of proud of that we had T-38 Talons uh, we had A7s, we had F4s, all of which we could fly anytime we wanted to. And that was just a, that was like the astronauts had. You know, they had, their airplanes were out there, and anytime you wanted to go fly, you you go fly. And it was good. It maintained proficiency. It wasn't just a good deal. And we did a lot of air-to-air -air stuff, and we'd go out and fight each other. That was very good for confidence and very good for uh, proficiency. The F-14 flies like a small airplane. It's a big airplane, but it flies well, flies, flies small. I enjoyed the A-4. The A-4 is a, a little sports car. You know, it's got 270-degree uh, per second roll rate. Put the stick over and you're through two 360-degree rolls about that quick. Uh, and, of course, the F-117, which turns out to be we, we tailored the flight control system so well that it's very easy to fly. I mean, it feels just like a, a normal airplane and one of the best normal of the normal airplanes. Like an F-15 is very easy to fly, uh, very easy to land, very easy to take off, and it, uh, excellent flying qualities. Uh, the reason that the uh, F-117 was retired was because of the F-22. Uh, the F-22 is, is a high-performance airplane. It can do what the F-117 can do. It carries its weapons internally. Uh, it can deliver air to ground. It can deliver, deliver air to air. It can go supersonic. Uh, it can cruise supersonic. And it's, uh, it's aerodynamically shaped. And you notice it has curved surfaces, and the F-117 has flat surfaces. And the reason was, when we des designed and built the F-117, the original program was not nearly as sophisticated as the programs they are using now to predict and develop stealth shapes. And so we had to go with flat surfaces, flat and angles. So that's where they, they differ. That's just in the money required. And then there's rumor around. It was mentioned the other day by a friend of mine uh, talking about Aviation Week had an article that They've seen an F-117 flying, and that would really make me feel good. <laughs>